So if you're just joining us, welcome. This is Symbio Beta Live, and my name is John Cumbers. I'm the founder and the CEO of Symbio Beta. And today we're talking all about environmental sequencing of the COVID-19 virus, that is the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And we have three very special guests joining us today. We have uh, Josh Perfetto, who is the CEO and the founder of Chai Bio down in Santa Clara. We have Emily LaProust, who is the CEO and founder of Twist Bioscience here in San Francisco. And we have Chris Mason, who is the Cornell Weill professor at Cornell Medical School. Welcome, Chris. Hello. So thank you all for joining me. We've got some very exciting work that everybody's doing in terms of environmental sequencing of the COVID-19 uh, virus, which is the SARS-CoV-2. And we're going to go through a few slides that each of our panelists have put together to help us understand what they're doing in this area. And then we're going to have an open Q&A with everybody and we welcome your Q&A. So if you're just joining us and you didn't hear me earlier, type your Q&A into the question box, answer other people's questions if you know the answer, and upvote the questions that you want me to ask. In addition, we want to know where you are dialing in from today. And we can see a lot of people in the chat box. We've got people from... Uh, from BASF, Tanya Jackson. Hi, Tanya. Long time no see. Thank you for joining us. We have uh, people from North Carolina. We have from Edinburgh, uh, Scotland. We have Boulder, Colorado. Hi, Larry. Good to hear from you. Uh, somebody from Samsung giant dialing in. Uh, Ellen Jorgensen. Somebody from Vienna in Austria. Welcome, Roland. So we have a great, uh, great group uh, joining in. Uh, Khaled from Stemloop at Northwestern University in Chicago. Welcome. Great to see so many people online. So as I said, we are live, and if you want to ask questions about what's going on today and what we're doing uh, in the chat box, uh, in the Q&A box, then please do. So without further ado, I want to introduce you to all of these people are my good friends. I was just talking about how long we've known uh, everybody, and it's, it's between uh, you know, six and ten years that I've known all of our three panelists today. So it's really wonderful to have them all together on this, uh, on this town hall today. Josh, I've known because he was one of the founders of BioCurious, the biohacker space in Sunnyvale. He was also the instigator of the Open PCR project, the Open QPCR project, and then the founder of Chai Bio. And Josh, if you could say a little bit about, for people who are just joining us, um, uh, about what, uh, what Chai does and some of the application areas. And, uh, and while you're doing that, I just want to, we're just going to put up a poll today to ask your, the audience's expertise in the area of environmental sequencing, whether you're familiar with qPCR, whether you're familiar with viral sampling, uh, what, your, what your expertise uh, level is. And that's going to help us pitch uh, how we explain today's content. So uh, if, you can, uh, if you can ask that uh, in, the, uh, in the poll, I see it's coming up on the screen. And then while we're doing the presentations, that's going to help our panelists understand how to pitch it. So Josh, over to you. What is, uh, give a, just a very brief explanation of qPCR and what it is and then what Chai is doing. Yeah. Um, so Chai is really focused on making molecular biological technologies more accessible. We started about five years ago when we did a Kickstarter for the open qPCR device. And so qPCR is a way that you can detect any kind of DNA or RNA, RNA sequence. Uh, so very useful for detecting microbes as well as viruses, such as the current uh, COVID-19. Um, and, you know, so we focus on making it lower cost and easier to use to make it accessible. So for example, we have people using this in food safety applications, um, in the breweries where they look for beer spoiler, spoilage organisms, water quality, um, all sorts of, basically everything under the sun. So in the environment all around us, we know there's a lot of microbes. There's the microbes far outnumber, un, outnumber other organisms. Even in our bodies, microbes far outnumber other organisms. And there's also then a lot of viruses because these viruses are getting into our bodies. They're getting into these microbes' bodies. So why is it important to track these down in industrial situations and, and how is it done? Oh, yeah, there's a lot of industrial uses. So like in, in food, you know, we're really concerned about salmonella, listeria, like E. coli. And it's done kind of two ways. One is that we test the food, but the other is that we do a lot of environmental testing. You know, you can't test every piece of food to make it safer. You'll destroy all your food testing it. Um, so you do a lot of swabbing of the environment to try to look where is like listeria present? Where is it harboring when you're uh, doing your cleaning in little cracks and stuff like that? So this is a very well accepted technique um, um, in uh, food safety. And the point is that by the time that the E. coli gets into your lettuce at, uh, at Whole Foods, it's too late. So you want to try to get to it mm -hmm. earlier. So you want to, for example, if you're running an E. coli farm, you might want to be swabbing the, the, the packaging plant for the E. coli or the plastic bags that you're putting 
the, uh, the, the, the lettuce in before it gets to the stage of, of getting contaminated on the truck or getting to Whole Foods. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you want to be more proactive, especially if, if you've got a processing facility where a lot of food is going by. If you get some contamination, especially salmonella, a whole bunch of food can get contaminated. Um, and, and really, the, you, you know, so the, the, you have to clean and that's the only, to ensure that the food is safe. But if you, it's really hard to detect where it's harboring. And, and so that's, that's really why we do the environmental testing. And most of it that's going on in the environment in terms of food and industry is mostly the things that you're mentioning, like salmonella and E. coli, these are bacterial cells, but is there much uh, need for testing viral contamination in industry and in food applications? Um, yeah, so that's not really as commonly done. I mean, norovirus is a concern, um, but yeah, most of the testing that we do is bacterial, bacterial uh, logical. Um, you know, I think what's, what we're seeing of this, you know, you know COVID-19 outbreak is that this is really one of the first times we start to see a lot of interest in virus environmental sampling. It's a golden age for biology. Walter Isaacson, the uh, biographer of Steve Jobs, had a wonderful piece in the um, Wall Street Journal yesterday that you should check out if you haven't seen it, all about the golden age of biology and how things like what Symbi Beta is doing in Symbi Beta Live and bringing science out of the closet and, and into people's homes is, uh, is, is going to see a flourishing of people's understanding. Even my own understanding of viruses and viral genomics and immunity has, has just shot up just in the last two weeks from doing these. So very interesting. I'll, I'll let you get onto the slides in just one second, but before I do, tell us about the beer. That's what everybody's, uh, that's oh. on everybody's lips right now. So one of your big customers is, is the, 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 the home, not the home brew industry, the craft brew industry. Why do they care about, about what's, in their, uh, what's in their facilities? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. And, and so like actually brewing is kind of a, a, biotechnol a very basic biotechnological ex uh, application where you're, you're using yeast to ferment this. Um, they have two types of problems. One is like uh, lactic acid bacteria that can spoil the beer and make it go so uh, sour. So it could be like fine when you package it, but you know, over time as it goes through the distribution channels, these things will grow and sour it. The other thing you have is wild yeast. There's like something called a diastaticus, uh, which basically can like over ferment the beer and it will make it um, actually continue to ferment while, you're, while it's in that bottle or the can. Uh, it not only affects the taste, but it actually causes this over carbonation, which can make the whole thing explode. Uh, which is very bad uh, to the, for the consumer, very bad for the brewery. So, you know, this is a very basic QC that all breweries have to uh, uh, do to ensure uh, good quality. Here's to that. Great. So um, the poll results are back in. We see that about 50% are intermediate, about 40% beginner and 16% advanced. So that'll help us to pitch uh, where we get this conversation right down the middle. And we have 43% uh, of you joining us from industry. So the majority of people from, uh, from industry. So that's great. Thank you, everybody. So Josh, if you want to just share your screen and we have a new policy on Symbiobeta, which is no boring slides. So <laughs> I've asked all the panelists for no boring slides. If there are boring slides, you're going to hear a giant sound of a klaxon going off and, uh, and I'm going and ask you to move on. So, uh, Josh, with, without further ado, over to you. All right, great. So, um, oops, sorry. So, uh, here at Chai, um, we, you know, we, we really have been thinking a lot about what do we do, um, kind of between now and when we are able to, um, um, kind of resolve this, this uh, problem of COVID-19. So just a few, a few uh, days ago, um, you know, Symbio Beta sent out something, uh, an infographic, uh, like when antibody treatments were gonna come online, that was expected to be, you know, around the August uh, this year, and vaccines, you know, going into kind of late next year. And, um, you know, so how do we, we're thinking about how do we get the economy more opened up between now and when we have that? Um, so, uh, and if you just want to hit present, Josh, you'll be in uh, the, uh, the screen. Yeah, right. okay, here we go. Thank you. Oh, you hit present a view, I think, instead of uh, present. Shit, oh, sorry. Um, okay, sorry about that. Um, I, the Zoom thing has come up over my normal thing here, so I'm trying to... Yeah, just down there on the left, the little present down beneath the apply to all, I think. Let me just maybe just make this a little it, bit bigger. Know, we'll just go through that. Yeah, it's all good. Just go for it. It's all okay. Good. Sorry about that, guys. Broke the, the rule of no boring slides. Um, <laughs> so, anyways, like, so kind of the, the SARS CoV 2 has been challenging um, you know, because you know, people can be contagious before that they have the, the symptoms. You know, it's up to a two week incubation period for the symptoms to occur. You know, not everybody goes and gets tested because they have very light symptoms. And you know, so we all kind of seen that the, the net result is that 
a number of people have been exposed by the time a, a positive case is detected. And so we're trying to think about, you know, how do we use what I was just talking about we do in the food safety industry uh, for, um, uh, for environmental testing to de detect the, the SARS-CoV-2 earlier. So what we've been doing is looking at testing something called fomites is the technical word for this. Because a fomite is basically some sort of inanimate object where people get um, the, uh, can get a viral infection from. So we've all been told, you know, cover our, our coughs, you know, uh, don't uh, wash our hands, don't touch our face. And that's because people can, um, you know, really the, in, in, infect their, their hand by sneezing on it, touch things like door, door handles and contaminate that. Other people touch that door handle, contaminate themselves, and then kind of you know touch their face and get contaminated. So you know that's a problem, but we can use it as an opportunity, um, you know, to swab these surfaces, uh, like you know door handles, pin pads, any sort of high touch surface, you know, bathroom doors, um, you know, uh, um, handrails, and then use that to detect the presence of the, the SARS-CoV-2 in the environment. And that, you know, if, we're, if you're able to do that, you, you can then take mitigating actions. And um, you know, an obvious one from the food industry is that we do increased sanitation and cleaning, but we can also use it for, for public health purposes, you know, initiate, you know, uh, more selective and surgical social distancing or what facilities need to be closed. Um, I think we can also use it the opposite way as well, uh, you know, kind of show where the virus is and isn't, and maybe, you know, where there can be green zones where, uh, there can be less social distancing. Um, and then I think another really important application is recommend diagnostic testing. If you think about like you have an internal door in a uh, uh, facility that's only open to employees and uh, inside of that you know, internal bathroom you detect this uh, virus, then you know, that, that's an indication that maybe one of your employees um, is infected and, and uh, they could be recommended to seek out diagnostic testing uh, due to a, a potential exposure. Excellent. So what we, so yes, what we so, to do, yeah, this concept of green zoning, we can come into uh, with the, in the Q&A, and, uh, and that's going to be interesting when we bring in Chris Mason to talk about what he's doing in New York. So, so the QPCR is the, is, the, is the solution that you have. So talk us through that quickly. Yeah, so we have like a, a three, we tried to make this very easy. So we have like a three-step process um, where basically people will, will first swab the sample. Then they, um, uh, do, we add this to a, a tube where we do a one-step RNA extraction. This actually uses the same um, RNA uh, extraction system that we use in our COVID-19 lab, uh, laboratory test to make it really easy and high throughput. And then you know, the, the result is put into this uh, qPCR uh, thermocycler, which is the same uh, RT qPCR technology that's used by the diagnostic labs to do this testing. Um, so we really wanted to make it very easy. We have uh, starter kits like this that let all sorts of businesses do this. Um, and yeah, it's the same type of solution that we've done in uh, things like breweries. Great. And we, we have a, a, Q, a question that's come in. Is qPCR reporting RNA or DNA or SARS-CoV-2 for SARS-CoV-2? And what are your thoughts regarding ineffectivity of the organisms reported by qPCR? I guess uh, I'm not quite sure I understand uh, maybe it's talking about false positives of, of, of other of, of viral uh, DNA. Yeah, so so the technology is called our reverse transcription uh, qPCR. So the reverse transcription is we first take the RNA and go to DNA. Then we do the qPCR, which like exponentially amplifies or copies the DNA to the point that the instrument can detect it. So the the selectivity of this technology is very good. You know that comes down to the the, the, the what's called the primer and probe sequences. Um, and so there's really not, there's always a risk of false positives, but I think in my opinion, that's very low. I think the bigger thing is the limit of detection, you know, how sensitive is this? Um, and, um, you know, because you, you, if, if we detect it, that shows something is present, but if we don't detect it, it doesn't definitively say it's not present. Um, Got it. And that's the big question. Great. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Josh. We'll come back to you in the Q&A. And I know you've got some interesting thoughts and, and discussions that you'd like to have. As a reminder, this is a live town hall and we'd like you to ask your questions in the question box the Q&A box and we'll also be taking live Q&A from the audience so if you would like to speak to our panelists please raise your hand in zoom and I will call on you make sure you've typed in your question in the Q&A and then raise your hand and you can ask your question live otherwise I'm happy to ask it for you next up we have Emily LaProust as I said Emily is the founder and the CEO of Twist Biosciences it's a publicly listed company that is making DNA um, and uh, Emily where are you right now uh, th uh, good morning, John. I'm, uh, I've been grounded for a few weeks, so I am in my happy place. I'm in uh, United Economy Plus. 
<laughs> but if Wonderful. you want to be if you want to be serious, I can uh, I can upgrade. Yeah, and, I think that, uh, uh, and go to the ISS. Okay, excellent. And that's going to be a wonderful segue into Chris Mason shortly. So uh, wonderful. So uh, Emily, Twist is uh, making DNA. Tell us a little bit about the DNA that you're making and in particular, some of the things that you're doing around this response to COVID-19. Yeah, thank you. So at Twist, we, we build a, a platform uh, based on silicon to write DNA. So the chemistry of writing DNA is known. You can buy a bottle of A, a bottle of G, a bottle of C, and a bottle of T, and you can uh, build you know any piece of DNA that you want and uh, there's a number of applications for that uh, one of them is in diagnostic to understand the gen genetic makeup of, of a, a sample and I can share a, a slide on that if you want yeah please and do uh, yeah uh, so uh, what we discussed earlier with Josh is um, uh, an RT-PCR test where you get a, a yes or yes or no uh, answer but uh, uh, which is very important. Um, and the next step is uh, you, you may want to know uh, what exactly is, is the virus. Uh, are there any mutations in that virus compared to what is known? And so uh, you, have a, you may have a, uh, you have a sample, can, can be a patient sample, can be an environmental sample, and in that sample there is a mix of, of the, the virus uh, uh, RNA or cDNA, in, in this case in, in red, but it's in the sea of a lot of other uh, uh, nucleic acid. And if you, if you sequence that, uh, it may be hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars uh, to get to uh, what you really want, which is the, the virus. And so at Twist, we use the DNA that uh, we make on our silicon chip as, as magnet and we basically can extract, it's called target enrichment, you can extract just the RNA sequence out of that sea of other nucleic acid, and then you can uh, sequence it. And uh, when you sequence it, it's not just a yes or no answer, which is very important, but it's the, the next step, which, which is what exactly is the virus. You, you get a read of every base of the virus, and here's a typical readout. Uh, and in this case, we've, we've compared the Wuhan uh, coronavirus versus the Australian uh, coronavirus, and there's a there's a ten days deletion. There's ten days that are missing uh, in the in the Australian uh, uh, version of the virus, and uh, I'm not showing it on this slide, but somewhere else on the virus uh, there is uh, another three bases that are different between Wuhan and, and um, Australia. But now you can do that at scale. You can compare Italy and New York and, and uh, San Francisco. You can even look at every different patient to see how the virus is evolving and inform uh, policy. Excellent. Well, thank you for that explanation, Emily. So just to repeat for everybody at home, when you're sequencing, particularly when you're sequencing environmental DNA samples, you've got a lot of stuff in there. You've got my DNA, you've got the bacterial DNA that might be in the environment, and then you've got the viral DNA. So you've got to, if you just went and sequenced everything, you'd just, uh, you, you'd spend all your money sequencing everything and you wouldn't maybe be able to get to the answer that you're looking for from the question that you're trying to answer, which in this case is how much COVID-19 viral DNA is in my sample. So what Twist offers is what's called a probe panel. Is that correct? That's right. We, we offer the, uh, the magnet in a way, and those are, are exactly our, our DNA probes uh, that have a biotin on it. Uh, and that DNA probe will go and, and capture through hybridization. It will capture the virus sequences, and then you use the, the biotin and the uh, streptavidin bead to do a physical separation of the virus from everything else. So these are two molecules, biotin and streptavidin. These are two that have a, a binding property. They like to stick to each other. And so you've got one of them that's in this, the viral sample, that uh, one, one of them that's in the viral sequence that you're looking for. So then that allows you to stick the magnet in with the other sticky, sticky molecule on it and it pulls out everything that you want. And then you can wash it off and send it to uh, sequencing. Is that right? That's right. And then and so what, what it looks like... Uh, if, yeah, if what, it, what it looks like, uh, here we did an experiment where uh, uh, at Twist we did not have access to the virus, so we just made it from scratch. And so we, we, made, a, we made synthetic controls. Uh, and uh, we did a virus, I should, I should uh, add it's not the... Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. it's not live. It's, uh, it's, uh, the virus is cut in, in uh, six fragments, so there's no biosafety issue. 
if you, you know, it's it's uh, it's safe. You can brush your teeth with it. Uh, and uh, and then we did uh, we did titration experiments where in multiple samples we use different levels of different amount of, of virus, um, as high as a million copies and as low as one copy. And so if you look at theoretically how much what's the viral fraction? It's very very small. It's a very very small amount of the virus in the sample. And so if you had to sequence the whole thing to get the virus, again, it would be uh, an uh, enormous uh, cost, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, which you can do once in a while, but you cannot screen an entire population. And then after enrichment on the right, you can see that uh, this is the result for uh, a million reads uh, on the sequencer. Uh, even if you only have one copy of the virus, you still get 300 uh, reads from the virus which is a viral, a viral fraction of 0.03%. And so it's, it's hundreds of thousands of fold enrichment. And so that means that you have to uh, spend uh, hundreds of thousands less than if you sequence the whole thing. Uh, and then obviously, if you, if you have a million copy of the virus, almost all of, the, all of the, the reads are from the virus. So you can save tremendous amount of, of, of uh, money, uh, which means that uh, you can uh, deploy the technology to many more samples. And so now you can you know, sequence every, every, uh, every human and you know, uh, every doorknob that, that uh, you're worried about. Great, excellent. Thank you, Emily. And uh, can you explain a little bit how these work? Your company sells these panels of DNA for, for enriching so that you don't spend all your money on sequencing everything, but you spend your money on sequencing what you want. If I'm a, if I'm a craft brewer, like Josh was explaining earlier, or I'm looking in my lettuce factory for E. coli, can I make a specific panel that's going to search for things that I'm looking for that are contaminating my sample? Can I, do I buy these set things from you? Like, do you have a panel specifically for COVID-19 virus and another one maybe for listeria for food sampling? Or do I have to go and tell you exactly what I want in my, in my, in my panel and then you, you make it for me? Yeah, so the answer is all of the above. Uh, so we have a pan viral uh, panel. So it's on the shelf uh, that will uh, look for all the viruses known to known to uh, mankind. Uh, once you, uh, if you identify a specific uh, pathogen, uh, then we can build it from scratch for you. We can uh, make a synthetic control, and then we can make a a, a very uh, uh, specific uh, sequencing NGS panel just for. Uh, what you're looking for. So we have one for SARS, SARS-CoV-2, V2. Um, we have one for respiratory uh, panel. We have one for the entire virus of uh, the, the entire family of coronaviruses. Uh, but then it, it can be very custom. If you have your own particular uh, um, uh, nucleic acid you know, genome that you want to look for, uh, you tell us and, and we'll make that uh, uh, custom for you. So it's, it's really uh, whatever you want. Uh, we have some uh, on the shelf and then we can make any uh, uh, as a custom synthesis. Fantastic. And that's the, power, that's the power of being able to write DNA at scale very affordably is that uh, you're not stuck with whatever is on the shelf. You can really uh, customize your, your, your science to what's needed for you. Fantastic. And Emily, what's, you talked about cost. What is the cost of one of these panels, roughly? Yeah. And so uh, uh, if when we did an experiment, uh, uh, the, the cost of the sequencing um, uh, to get something like that uh, can be as low as $5 per sample uh, for the sequencing. And there's a little bit more uh, for the reagents on top of it. But uh, uh, the sequencing portion can be very affordable. Uh, such that you, you can really uh, push it to uh, as many samples as you want. Great, excellent. So we're going to come on to Chris Mason very shortly um, to talk about swabbing the New York subway and what's going on in that regard. But Emily, if you can just keep up your slide, because I do want to talk about some of the other work that Twist is doing in the biopharma space, sure. uh, because it's related to the infographic that we put out just yesterday with Leaps by Bayer, particularly around two of the therapies that are coming in the timelines towards this. Um, Twist is also doing some very exciting work, both in the vaccine development and in the development of antibody 
therapeutics. So Emily, I'm going to let you just say a little bit about both of those. But before we do, I just want to remind everybody that this is a live town hall and we want to hear your questions. I see that we have nine questions. I'd like you to help me decide which questions we want to ask the panelists. We'll get through as many as we can. So just upvote the questions that you want me to ask. And we'd also like you to ask them live. So if you've asked the question and you want to ask it live, just raise your hand and we'll call on you as soon as we've uh, gone through all of these uh, panelists here. So um, with that, uh, Emily, tell us a little bit about the work that Twist is doing both on the vaccine front and the antibody therapeutics front. Yeah, thank you. So what we've talked so, so far is about the reading part of DNA, which is very important, you know, as Josh mentioned. Uh, if you can read, uh, you, know, you, you kind of know what, what to do. You can wash more, uh, you can uh, isolate socially, which is, which is good. But in addition, if you can write DNA, uh, now you can have uh, even more proactive action. And there's this two, um, two uh, threads that uh, we are supporting. One is, is vaccine. And you have companies like Innovio uh, who uh, get uh, uh, non-infectious uh, part, infectious part of the virus from twist. We, we write those uh, attenuated sequences uh, from scratch. And then uh, they do the work of developing a vaccine from that. And so then the idea is... Uh, in, in you know, 14 months, you may have a vaccine that uh, will protect um, uh, everybody or will create, if not everybody, at least create some herd protection. So that there you need a, access to a lot of DNA to try all of those different vaccine um, um, ideas. And then the second thing that we can do is around therapeutic uh, antibody where uh, it could be that uh, some people uh, don't, don't respond to a vaccine seen uh, they may still get sick and so there you uh, it would be ideal to have uh, a, a drug on, on the on the shelf uh, that will uh, neutralize the anti the, uh, the virus and so what happens is uh, there's already a few people that that got the virus and they recovered meaning that their immune system has mounted a defense and so those people in their body they have an antibody that, that just uh, neutralize that virus. And so uh, uh, groups like uh, the Crow Lab at Vanderbilt University got access to those patients that recovered. They sequenced the immune system of those patients and they got a list of potential antibodies. They don't always know which one is a uh, new one. And so uh, what they've done is um, they've ordered uh, from twist thousands of those potential antibodies that we are making, they will screen them, and then uh, hopefully they will find the one that they'll be able to make at scale and, and use that therapy uh, for the future. And I'm just bringing up our infographic that we published yesterday. If you haven't seen it, you can go online and download it. We actually are encouraging people to take it and adapt it for their own use. As long as you keep the uh, the logos of Symbi Beta and Leaps by Beta on it, we're happy for you to do that and we'd love you for to do that. We've actually had it translated into Spanish yesterday, which was wonderful. And you can see on this infographic, this is what Emily's talking about right now, which is the antibodies from the patients who have recovered. And, uh, and that's a big hot area. And we'll be hopefully having uh, Jim Crow from Vanderbilt on the show uh, the week after next. And there's also an other models that are going on in terms of uh, producing these human antibodies in mice, and then engineering and evolving these from previous vaccines that have been developed. And then once that's they right. get inside the cell, that's, uh, that's how they're active. Emily, thank you so much. That's a great thank explanation you. And, uh, and I appreciate it. Um, Chris Mason, uh, over to you. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And, uh, and, and the segue, of course, from Emily with Emily on the space station is that, Chris, you're, you're pretty famous for, for uh, sequencing uh, astronaut poop. Uh, tell me about that. Yes. Uh, well, you know, I'll, I'll, and you can hear me okay. The audio sounds good. We got you. Great. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, I'm a big fan of uh, stool in all its forms and places. <laughs> and space. Uh, you know, not not for every instance in use, but at least for the uh, medical and sort of you know diagnostic utility, it's very clear. So we, yeah, you know, we uh, published uh, last year the the twin study. Most people have probably heard about that, uh, but it is you know a complete multi-omic longitudinal examination of what happens to the human body in space, and also looking at sort of the walls of the space station. We have several long, uh, papers in review about that. So there's um, everywhere we go is a, a living ecosystem. We're kind of all in this big nucleic acid soup together. So um, I know that gets kind of a segue into what other work we're doing in the lab, yeah. And just very briefly, this was the uh, the astronaut twins. One of them was on the space station for for uh, for a number of months, and then the other one was on Earth. And they had their microbiome sequenced, all the all the uh, all the bacteria inside of their gut, 
before they went on the space station and after they went on the space station. And and just in just very briefly, Chris, what were the what what were the differences that were found from that study? Yeah, so we actually examined you know, oral microbiome, skin microbiome, stool. I'll see what happened in actually their gut diversity in terms of what was found in stool. Uh, it actually, you know, did stay relatively stable, but the ratio of different species, such as uh, firmicutes to bacteroides, uh, did shift in a potentially negative direction, but nothing that was clinically or medically uh, dangerous. But it did get disrupted. You can see in flight, and then came back down. Whereas, you know, Mark Kelly, who stayed on Earth, who's now running actually for Senate in Arizona, his microbiome stayed uh, much more stable. So you could see there is a bit of a perturbation of being in space. And we see the same thing with mouse models as well when we fly them up in space. And they kind of float around in the mouse cages, unsure what to do for a while. Great. Do you endorse that microbiome? Uh, do I endorse the microbiome? Like to use it? Uh, if, it's, if it's useful, uh, yes, I'd say, say yes. I was just <laughs> trying to make a clever joke about him running. <laughs> but, uh, let's uh, let's move on. If, if you want to open up this, is, yeah, is go Scott ahead. Kelly did write an op-ed in New York Times because he said, okay, everyone's staying at home. Let me give you some advice. I had to stay in one like tube of aluminum for a year. Here's my advice. So it was a really great op-ed if you want to know like how do you survive uh, being holed up in your house for a while. Here's a good uh, tutorial about it. Chris, are you friends with Mark? Uh, well, we email and we're still doing testing. So we, uh, we chat occasionally whenever there's exciting results, but um, we haven't sat down and had, had beers together uh, or anything uh, quite intimate, but it's been, uh, it was still, the study in some ways is still ongoing. So yeah. When are you going to have results coming, coming out and can we get Mark on the show? Yeah, hopefully. Uh, Mark or Scott there. Uh, so this was one big paper came out that was across all teams, but there's still another about 12 different papers all in various stages of production that detail more immunological changes other microbiome data, looking at transcriptional dynamics, microRNAs, other sort of vagaries of the telomere sequencing we saw, strange things. So there is a, a lot more papers coming out soon. So it might be timely in a few months when if some of them come out to, to have them out back on the show. That'd be a great idea. Fantastic. Well, we have a lot of questions oh, yeah. coming in and we'll get to the questions shortly. Um, you can vote the questions up or down and you can raise your hand to ask them to our panelists live. So Chris, uh, everybody's waiting to find out what you've been doing on the New York subway. You've been going around there, swabbing the subway and, uh, and finding uh, interesting viral sequences and other sequences. So this isn't your first rodeo at doing this. Uh, you've, uh, tell us about the work you've done in the past and maybe you want to show, show us some of the, uh, the pictures of, uh, of what's been going on in New York. Yeah, and I've got a few pictures of some swabbing that we've been doing and preliminary results of what we found uh, in the subway system. So I'll, I'll start off with a bit of good news is we don't have any good solid evidence that there's SARS uh, CoV-2 in the subway. Uh, we're, we just have a very limited data set so far, but we're, the collection is ramped up and we're collecting lots and lots of samples. So I'll show, uh, we're gonna post a lot of this data into a preprint that we're just, I was hoping to be online by today, but it's probably gonna be on early next week. And uh, I'll share, I'll just go, I'll just jump right in. So we've been swabbing, uh, as some of you may have heard me tell the story, I got really interested in metagenomics for two reasons. One is I kept sequencing human genomes and not all of the reads that were supposed to go to human landed there. It's because uh, they're microbial. So even in tumors recently, there's been a lot of papers showing microbes can be embedded in tumors and change how you view chemotherapy. So there really is a much more appreciative cross kingdom view of biology, both in, in my lab, I think in the field in, in general. So that was one thing. The second thing is when my, my daughter I got old enough to ride the subway, she did one day I actually lick a subway pole, which I was terrified about. So I really wanted to know what was there, what had happened. There had been, you know, we all have microbial exchanges, uh, you know, with our mouths when we're kids, and that's part of growing up. And some people, when they're in middle school, it's a longer story. But there is, you know, a continual microbial exchange that happens. It's just not usually in that way with the subway. But I, I just got curious. And so we've been swabbing the New York City subway since 2013. And now globally, many other cities. And I'll do. I have a quick few slides. I'll go through. Let me quickly share my screen, and I'll um, I'll kind of show how this links to uh, some other features uh, for other work in the lab. So, in particular, uh, as most of you know, I don't have to belabor the point. There's a lot of cases around the world right now, and the U.S. just eclipsed China as the place with the most cases. So, what we've been wanting to do is leverage a global network of science that we have here. So, we're doing the New York City subway, but we are one of a large flank of researchers and scientists uh, who want to do this uh, sort of swabbing. Let's see if I can, I can't quite hide it perfectly, but you get the sense this is the um, uh, Meta Sub Consortium, which is metagenomics of subways and urban biomes and seeing what is happening in our city. Every summer we do a sampling, but we've moved things up this year uh, to do two samplings because we uh, want to actually see what's present on the RNA of different surfaces. So. In this case, oh, uh, one thing, just a quick note about the Medicine Consortium, they're very dedicated scientists. Uh, you can see here wow. last, last year, 
uh, Alina, she actually got arrested, but then before she got uh, a sort of detainment, she said, can I swab the detainment cell? So she did that. Uh, some people get very creative in their annual sampling. This is uh, Naranan Najrahan's uh, team in Singapore. So uh, it's really great uh, stuff on Twitter that comes up every summer. It's actually, it's a really fun group of scientists to, to work with. It's a pleasure to work with. Uh, I see some of them on the call here today. Uh, Barat, sir, can I question? Was, was she really arrested or, was, or were you just joking? Uh, well, detained. Arrested is strong. She was detained briefly, but but uh, was let go. So it was just just for a little while. Um, what was so, detained for? Well, some people get upset. So the biggest d danger of swabbing in public places is that some people think correctly that you're just collecting a sample. Other people, however, think you might be leaving something behind, mm -hmm. uh, w which uh, is is it can be technically a crime if you do it, uh, you know, if you do it the wrong way. So, uh, but keep in mind, we all leave our skin cells everywhere we go. So there's, in some ways, you have no choice. Uh, but this, this is a couple of pictures from last summer. But what we've been doing starting uh, about two months ago, seeing the uh, uh, pandemic emerge, is we started with the pilot cities and it's expanded out just this week to do almost all the rest of the cities. But these are the ones that are out swabbing and collecting RNA samples. Uh, and you can see here the cities listed on the map. So far, it's using an isohelic swab and putting in D a DNA RNA shield so it preserves the RNA at room temperature for at least 30 days. The pilot was 1,600. We're going to expand out uh, for the whole track. It's about 10,000 samples that's ongoing right now. And the, the data, the consortium is very open. So if people want to see the data, we're uploading some of our current uh, RNA sequencing data up on the Wasabi portal so people can play with the data. The principles of it are very much about open science and sharing methods and best practices. And so it's especially relevant for times like this when there's a global crisis. So we can all uh, work together, share reagents, share expertise. Uh, just a couple of pictures from this the SARS sampling effort that we have ongoing. Here's uh, David Denko from the lab doing floors and air sampling. Uh, you can see here, this is uh, near Penn Station. Uh, this is from Seattle, Washington. You can see there's not that many people uh, left as of a few days ago out and about. In the Alexander Platz, this is in Berlin. So you can see some of the other places here. And then also Argentina. So just kind of a quick snapshot of different places. South Korea, Daegu, which is one of the biggest outbreaks in South Korea. They've been sampling uh, since the 15th. And so we'll be, you know, again, the sampling is ongoing and the sequencing's just started. So it's really interesting to see what's been around. We're looking in Sao Paulo and Brazil, uh, in Tokyo, of course, in Shibuya Station. And what we've been doing with the samples is, you know, there's a lot of ways you can analyze a sample. So if you could even look at some of the you know, lysis results, but when you get RNA out, we often want to look at, um, you know, if we can, we'll bank it. But there's, there's fast methods. Some are CRISPR and CAS-12A well, or CAS-13-based methods. There's one called LAMP, which is also very fast. I'll show you a little bit of data from that. RT-PCR is what most people are doing today in the clinical labs, what we're doing at Well for now right now. There's also variations of RNA sequencing that let you examine a variety of different features. Uh, and also there's direct RNA sequencing like with MinI and also Capture Panel. We've been playing with the Twist uh, Capture Panel, which I'll show you a little bit of data from and some other controls as well, which are essential to the science to be able to have a control, which I think Twist, uh, uh, and, you know, as Emily said, you can brush your teeth with it, which uh, I can confirm it does taste kind of minty. So I, if you really are running out of toothpaste, you can use the synthetic RNA from Twist. So <laughs> what we've seen so far uh, is uh, a good coverage. Actually, some of these are clinical positive samples and also some of the synthetic RNA. So this is the full 30 KB virus. We can see here uh, from some of the first RNA sequencing data from clinical samples, we're seeing good coverage of the virus. We're in the process of uploading these to uh, next train, which I'll show you a slide of shortly, but we can see um, also some of the controls here you can see uh, are also over here on the left, which are uh, the controls which we know also work great to getting the full length coverage. Uh, so and talk, again, so, yeah, okay. uh, go back a second, Chris, and talk us through the, the, uh, the sequencing data here. So this is um, reverse transcription. So we're looking at DNA now from the RNA virus. Is that right? Uh, oh, no, RNA. So, well, you have to do uh, RT first. So it, it is basically you have to make cDNA first, uh, you do, in order to actually see the virus. Uh, and the, the only way you can do, actually, just to jump back there, the only way you can get the RNA in its naked form is just to do the direct RNA sequencing with MinION. There, there was, we published a paper in 2012, you could, in principle, do it on PacBio if you put a, a reverse transcriptase instead of a DNA polymerase in the bottom. Uh, but that has not been commercialized further. But, there, you know, currently today, if you want to do only the RNA, this is, uh, the only way to do so. But once you capture it, you can then actually, as Emily was describing, you can make cDNA or also, uh, I was described also from Chai Bai, you, know, you can use that same RT-PCR system, uh, quickly make cDNA and then you can measure it quantitatively. Got it. So let's just pause on this uh, technical slide for a second. So you've got these, there, there are six different assays that you are using or you have used or that various people around the world are doing. Is that right? 
this is just what we're doing. There's other assays that are out there, you know, there's antibody assays, there's variations like I alluded to of the CRISPR methods. This is kind of our current workflow, what we're working on uh, as everything that comes from pathology. And so I think we, we're viewing this very much as a, you know, th this is probably a ho well, hopefully a once in a century kind of pandemic. And there's certainly a lot we can learn from these samples. So we're doing everything we can to aliquot and preserve as much of the RNA from all the clinical samples and to examine them as comprehensively as possible. So the, these methods, we've been using uh, New England Biolabs for the prep kits. There's, of course, other ones, but this is from Oxford Nanopore. They do direct RNA. And the other good thing about this is you can get full length RNA. You can see here, uh, you can also look at polydemylation sites. Uh, some of the other sequencing methods look at both host and viral uh, cDNA. You notice here I put cDNA, not RNA, because it's technically what it is. And our RTP starts using uh, two primers for the envelope and spike genes at the hospital. But there's uh, ongoing questions about which ones you could use other ones as well. And as most of you know, the CDC ones that first came out were actually not uh, that good. It appeared no one had taught them how to use primer three at some point. But the uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so the uh, as I think as most people on this call probably use. Uh, and then also this is also a little bit of data from LAMP, which is a protocol for rapid PCR. So you have the, the you have the sample collection, then you have the assay that you're using to to uh, to convert it into a format that you can sequence it. You have the timeline there, and then you have the mechanism that you're using to sequence. So the MinION, that's from Oxford Nanopore. And then you've got a number of other, probably you mentioned uh, Illumina, PacBio. So depending on the method you use, you can, you can use a different set of sequencing technologies on the right there. And then I didn't realize you could do direct RNA sequencing with the, with the Nanopore. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. So you can, in principle, the, the only challenge is you need 500 nanograms of polyadenylated RNA. So it's a lot of RNA, the, the COVID-19 virus, which is the, you know, SARS-CoV-2, does have a poly -A tail. So it actually has a 33 nucleotide poly -A tail. So it's why you can do poly RNA seq and you can prime on that with the nanopore sequencer. Another protocol that has been published is you can actually make a splint that actually attaches to what is the motor protein and will only bind to its complementary target. So there's ways you could, in principle, only sequence the SARS-CoV-2 virus as it comes through. But uh, I've not seen it yet. That's something that's been published for other viruses uh, like Zika. And so Got presumably it. it's just a design question. But yeah. Got it. So if, if you can now go back to the sequence. So the sequence is 30,000 base pairs, if, if I'm right. If you could just talk us yes. through the sequence and which bits of it are conserved, that is they're very similar to previous coronaviruses or they're very similar to, to, to other, um, when you sequence, everything is the same. And talk about which bits are, are, are different and in the, the, the different samples, like the Wuhan sample or the Australia sample that Emily mentioned, which bits of those are, are changing? How much of the variation are we seeing when you do this sequencing of the DNA of all these viruses? Which bits are the same and which bits are different? Yes, that's a good question. You can see here some of the colors. Anytime you see a color differential, you will see there are some uh, genetic variants there. And so we can see some of them here. And actually, since I'm sharing my screen, I'll switch quickly over to, uh, I turned off most things, but it's probably the best place to look at all the variants that are known to date is Nextray. And if people haven't been to this website, um, it's uh, probably one of my favorite uh, websites to visualize the data. You can see where are all the different strands that have emerged over time, and then where essentially have, do they look like they've been moving. So of course the outbreak started in Wuhan and has since uh, you know, spread quite quickly throughout the world. And you can see based on the phylogenetic analysis of the nucleotide divergence, where do we see those strains mapping around the world? We've just started uploading some of our data into GIS-8, which is basically where uh, the next strain team pulls that data from and then creates these phylogenetic and basically uh, tracing maps of where do we see the viruses emerging. So you can see uh, you know, as most of you probably know when you read the news, it's really uh, dramatically expanded in the past few weeks. Uh, and is really now uh, truly a global pandemic. At, at the bottom, you can see what's really exciting is if you look down here, you can change by the number of nucleotides or amino acid changes. Where do we see the most genetic diversity is really, this is, uh, at least from what I've seen so far, probably the best and most straightforward uh, site that displays that. So here you can see the different, uh, in the op open reading frames or in some of the, the, basically the envelope gene or the spike gene, you can see where do you see these spikes of genetic diversity. So. Uh, this is one thing that, of course, uh, Twist thinks about is if you're designing capture probes, uh, you want to design them to be as tolerant as possible in general. But then if you know where the mutations are, you can actually even build uh, probes into that for capture. So was, um, so having these kind of genetic maps uh, helps you design primers, helps you design capture probes, helps you know where the mutations are, and also helps you think about vaccine development, of course. Chris, this is absolutely amazing. So what we're seeing here is a phylogenetic tree in the top left. So we're seeing how the virus has evolved over time and over geography. 
and you're seeing different clades emerge as you're showing in the different colors. So a clade being a group of, of that sequence, uh, That's right. similar uh, viruses with a similar sequence. And then you're being able to track where they came from. So maybe could we just zoom in then on the Seattle? Cause we know that that was the first kind of a big outbreak in the U S. So can you zoom in on that and just talk a little bit yeah, about yeah. what we saw in Seattle? Yeah. And you can see that in the, the, so this data is usually one or two days old. It's getting caught up. Well, you can see here, there's actually 1500 genomes that have been sampled. So you either have to do full length, uh, R minion sequencing or RNA sequencing to get the variant calls for the genomes. And we just finished the first, uh, 30 of them here. And we will have about another 300 by next, uh, next Wednesday vlog as well. We'll, up, we'll be uploading our data up here. Great. And if you want to follow along at home, this is nextstrain.org slash ncob. And Kevin can type that into the, uh, into the chat box. That's so great. great. Yeah. Right. And you can see, if you zoom in, you can see uh, where, where did this, you know, when it, when it hit Washington, and it, it kind of puts the little dot, you know, it's not actually in Seattle, it just does it state by state. But you can see when they landed there, and then uh, how big was it, and then where did they go from there? And so, you know, it's an inference, so it's not a perfect map of necessarily, you know, who brought it, but you can see here quite distinct clades. So if you look here, you can see this whole red group here are all the whole genomes that are this distinct genetic subgroup of the virus that almost all look like they're in, in Seattle, right? So this is, you know, you have to be careful because there's been popularized an L and an S strain based on early divergence, you can see here. But um, uh, as Trevor Bedford describes, and actually he's one of the programmers here, uh, does brilliant work on this. You, this could just be how the virus distributed early on. It's not necessarily a functional difference in the virus, but you can see uh, much like an evolutionary tree, different branches that indicate, you know, potentially different subgroups. But you know, I can't emphasize enough that the the you know, and these is mostly European clade you can see here, but occasionally some Australian. <clears throat> and then down here you can see there's a sort of Saudi Arabia uh, sort of samples are here. You see some more in England, and I see some other ones here. So you see variations of them: Taiwan, Hangzhou, uh, some of the Chinese clade also showing up here. So, which cool is you can zoom in if you want to look at each one and just look at specific samples. Where did they come from and where did they likely diverge? Uh, so that's great. Yeah. And if you can just go back to your presentation and show us the sequences, you talked about these spike proteins. We're actually going to be doing a, uh, a structural analysis of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus next Wednesday, sorry, next Thursday morning at 8 a.m. in a virtual environment called Nanome with some people who are looking at structures. Rob Reinhardt and the, uh, and the founder of Nanome are going to be on the show, uh, as well as Robert Scoble, Who's a, who's a VR expert, and uh, Philip Rosedale, cool. who's the founder of Second Life. So we're, we're doing a whole bunch of stuff where we're going to bring up the virus uh, shape and let everybody look at it. Tell me about these spike proteins that we keep hearing about, uh, and, and tell, yeah. Us, yeah, tell us what you can about the spike proteins, and then tell us how we're seeing the sequences, uh, how that relates to the sequence we're looking at here. Yeah, happily. And so if you can see my mouse, this is the spike gene that's down here. And so this is where we see different genetic variants pop up in some of our samples. And we're, you know, again, put these will all be up in GSA shortly and also shared with the world for people to help map and understand the pandemic. But there is genetic variation here. And it's, um, you know, there's, there's other sets of variation as well. But this is what is uh, what people worry about a lot in the vaccine development is because this will change a lot of, of how you can actually design how this, how this virus is read by the cells is the change in the spike protein. So, uh, so we do see genetic variants, but it isn't a, I wouldn't say, I'm not going to call it a hot spot yet or something quite like that. It seems to be, there is genetic variation, but we see it across uh, other genes as well and other groups have seen it. So I will not yet make any broad claims, but there is genetic variation, which is very important to know, uh, to, especially for vaccine development. Right. And then uh, just a, a couple more slides, just to zoom in of some of the variants when you do consensus alignments uh, where we see, again, this is the reference strain. We can look at some of the uh, clinical samples and also some of the positive controls that we see uh, as well, and some of the variants of them. Uh, and then, oh, I already showed you this, so this is the strain typing data. And our last couple slides are just that we've been actually using this new LAMP assay, which can work in about 30 minutes to see, you know, have we found it in environmental samples? And the answer is so far, no. We've done another 100 reactions, and so the, some of the good news is we haven't yet seen it, uh, any real strong evidence of it in the subway, so that's good. We haven't done extensive sampling, but we're in the middle of all that collection now. And this assay works for you know, clinical samples as well. So we can see it here. Uh, and this was, there was a, a Chinese group that had first tested this out, and we now have it working here as well. And so we'll be sharing those protocols online uh, in a preprint that should, again, should be out next week. Uh, right. as a quick, so I've, we've done other yeah. pop-up labs before, and I think eventually we could have more pop-up labs like at Chai Biosciences. Um, and uh, quickly, there's a whole bunch of other things you can do once you get sequenced that at the end slide here. And the last thing is what have we found in the subway so far for RNA viruses? So again, 
no strong evidence of SARS yet, but here's some of the things we do see. is we, If you just grab a subway sample and sequence it on the RNA level, which is different from the DNA, we do see about 10% of it is human DNA. We see a lot of it's unknown. So these are cleaned reads, so they should be, have, be coming from somewhere. But we see, we have seen flu, actually. We've seen, you know, which you wouldn't, is not uncommon at this time of year. We see phage RNAs. We see some other uh, intriguing sort of uh, alpha viruses. There's different viruses there. And some of them, and this is data, is, this literally came from this morning, so it's very new data. But, you know, uh, with anything you find on surfaces, we're doing a lot of double checking to see, you know, if you see tobacco mosaic virus, uh, that might be there from a plant maybe, but you also have to control for the enrichment of how many of these species are in the databases and make sure you do much, you know, very careful analysis of the data. So this is very, very new data, but uh, again, we'll be getting thousands of samples over the next few weeks and we'll have a very comprehensive and multi-omic uh, characterization of them. So that, so stay tuned, there's more to come. And of course, I want to thank everyone, the clinical, academic, government industry partners. Thanks, Twist, who's, who's helping us with the controls very early on. And of course, Krista, Ben, uh, and uh, Councilman, two Bens over there on the right. And that's it. Thanks a lot. Yeah, awesome, yeah. Chris. Thank you so okay, much. So, so the big takeaway: um, this is a good news uh, webinar. There, there, there wasn't um, SARS-CoV-2 found from your swabbing of the New York of the New York subway. There's a whole bunch of other stuff that you found of, of viruses and influenza and things like that that we know are out there. And it really just goes to show the the durability of the human body and the human immune system that all this stuff is out there and, and generally we don't need to worry because we're producing antibodies to, to keep it all out of us. I think the other thing to, to note from your data is really interesting is that 10% was human and 2% was viral and that would be 88% Oh, it, doesn't, yeah. it doesn't matter for anything. I mean, that's just yeah. crazy that after so yeah. much sequencing that we're still seeing 80%, 88% of the DNA that you find on the New York subway doesn't, doesn't map to things that we already know about. Yeah, and that's very, it's, you know, that's from just a handful of samples. So, we're, you know, to everyone treat these data as very preliminary, but it's interesting. And also, it's not as crazy as it sounds. Like for the DNA sequencing, even there still, you'll get 50 to 60, sometimes 70% of the fragments don't match any known uh, genome at all. So the fact that our transcriptome is, is, is pretty mysterious or more so uh, in terms of what RNAs are there is not shocking, but it is higher than what you'd find on the genetic side. So it, it, these are very new data. We'll be uh, working on it uh, and sharing. We'll also be sharing these data as soon as we can so other people can get their eyes on the data uh, and play with it. Awesome. Well, we have a few minutes left at the end now for Q&A. We have 19 questions asked. So hit the ones that you like and we'll try to get to those. And if you want to ask your question live, raise your hand and, uh, and I'll dial you in. So if we can go to the panel view and let's uh, ask the biggest question is, is it still infectious? So that's the, that's the big one. Nobody yeah. wants to be handling stuff. So Chris, maybe you can take that and then Josh uh, after that. Yeah, actually, David Coyle, a great post on this on microbe.net, is the, the answer is, is probably not. And so seeing a, a virus is not the same as it being an infectious virus. Even it being an infectious virus doesn't mean that you'll get infected. Even if you get infected, it doesn't mean you'll get sick. So there's all these uh, layers between an actual viral sequence and the manifestation of disease and you know, using Cox postulates, for example, to, to validate them. So what we're looking at is just the presence of the viruses. We are doing testing in Vero 6 cells and other cell culture meeting to see can the virus even infect a cell if it's still there, which is ongoing, so, which you have to do to even just see if it is viable. But uh, it's very important to note that just seeing a fragment of RNA on a surface does not mean it's infectious. Because there's been reports of up to nine days or even 17 days of the virus being present on the surface, particularly in the, the Diamond Princess cruise ship. I don't know if people saw that report, but you know, the virus can hang around for a while, but how long it's actually infectious is something you can only really do in cell culture. You, you would never get an IRB to say, I'm going to take this subway swab and put it in your mouth, right? So you have to, you can do it in cultured cells to, to test it. Great. And the IRB is the, the institutional review board that's approval Thank for doing yeah. uh, human studies. Uh, Josh, uh, over to you. We have a couple of concerns that, you know, you're, you're, you're making these Q, uh, RTQ-PCR machines for um, and the reagents for doing environmental sampling, isn't that taken away from crucial uh, testing that's needed for, for real patients? And then also, you know, things like the availability of swabs and, and things like that. And then we have also a couple of uh, questions for you on the cost per sample and the turnaround time. So Josh, if you can take those ones. Yeah, I mean, we use our own machines so, and we have them available. So we're, we're not concerned that we're taking it away from testing. I mean, people can buy them today. Um, but I'd like to add, like, you know, you know with RT-QPCR, you can, it's true that a virus may not be alive, but we're not that concerned about that. We think the greater, um, that the, the thing that we really want is greater sensitivity. And if, it, if, if there's RNA there and it's not, it's still not, uh, it's not alive, but, you know, it's detectable, it's well on its way to not being detectable. Um, so I think that it's uh, the greater sensitivity is, is what's uh, more useful. 
Great, excellent. And then we have a question for you, Emily. Uh, are you offering a commercially available package for sequencing environmental samples? And maybe you can also talk about where do people go if, they, if they're interested in these panels that you talked about or ordering them for themselves. Uh, yeah, absolutely. They are, they are available uh, online. You go to twistbioscience.com slash shop and uh, you, know, you, can, uh, you can order positive controls. You can order uh, sequencing uh, kits and we provide everything from uh, the sample all the way to being ready to go onto the sequencer. And then you need to have access to an Illumina sequencer uh, to be able to, to do the analysis. But yeah, it's, um, uh, we try to make it as uh, easy as possible for people to, to have access such that uh, we can remove the friction and, and more testing can be done. Great, excellent. And we have a couple of interesting questions here. One, uh, looking ahead to a post-pandemic world, a new normal, how do we achieve routine environmental tests at scale, i.e. offices, public spaces, and incorporate that into public health monitoring? Um, I was uh, seeing Balaji, the former CTO of, uh, of Coinbase, who was online, and he's been uh, talking about uh, creating these green zones and red zones to in order to get the economy back to work where you can have these green zones of people that have been tested environments that have been tested and everybody in those green zones can get back to work even before you get on a plane you've got to uh, show what what you've you know where you've been in the last 14 days and you can then get on a plane and go to other countries so uh, what what does this post pandemic world look like chris yeah, I, I think people previously thought that the cost of doing routine surveillance was too expensive. And I think as Josh has shown and, you know, the other kids coming from Twist and what we're doing, it's now actually possible to do things at scale for surveillance. And it's clear that the economic cost of, of what happens when you don't do it and you haven't caught something in time is, is probably far worse than whatever the cost would be for uh, even a minimal level of surveillance. So I, I think the new normal might include a pretty renewed focus on this question. And then Ellen's asking, have you had resistance from people uh, who don't want you to, to do environmental testing because they don't want to know the results? Seems quite stupid, but, uh, but have you had that? Yeah, uh, so generally most people don't want to know. Um, I, I prefer to run towards information rather than away from it. But uh, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a personal choice. If, you know, even what newspaper you pick up will determine what's in your brain a little bit. So you have to make the choice of what you, what you, uh, what you absorb. Great. And Chris, could you just go into a little bit more detail about this LAMP assay? Because it's pretty revolutionary. What does LAMP stand for? And, uh, and, and talk about the colorimetric piece of this, because that's, that's one of the innovative parts. Yeah. So and we've been working on that a lot in the past few weeks as a way to get something faster, uh, especially for medical personnel at the hospital. They just, you know, they're on the front lines working all day and, you know, working 16, 17 hour days. So we want to give them a way to quickly test if they might be positive, at least as a screen. And so it's, uh, it stands for loop mediated isothermal amplification it was first uh, published by a Japanese group in 2014 and commercialized by Newman Biolabs that same year. And now it's available as a kit. You just have to make sure you get the right primers and you can optimize the reaction. But it is something that is pretty, we think, uh, intriguing and was has tested a bit in China. And we're also, uh, again, it's going to be in the preprint that's coming out soon. So stay tuned. And we have uh, a lot of data on that, but it looks as a really promising way forward for sure. Great. Excellent. Well, we're coming up towards the end of the town hall today. Thank you all. We haven't got around to all of the uh, questions, but, uh, but it's certainly been a very uh, interactive one. Uh, Keith Robertson has a question. Any estimate of LOD of your sequencing approach? Maybe you can just define LOD for us, Chris. Yeah, uh, yes, from the samples we've done on the sequencing, if you do a twist capture, the it, it theory goes down to one virus. If you, because that's the advantage of capture, is you get rid of everything else. For jo we've just been looking at the data now for the the we think the sensitivity looks to be about ninety percent. Uh, it actually correlates very well with the RT PCR. If you have a high viral titer, you get a lot of the RNA. It's very easy to see in RNA sequencing. If it's a low viral copy, you have to either do PCR to enrich it or capture to to get it out. Otherwise, you just won't see it. Excellent. Well, just enough time for me to thank all of our panelists today. Emily LaPruce, the CEO of Twist Biosciences, Josh Perfetto, the CEO of Chai Bio, and Chris Mason, professor at Cornell University. We hope that you enjoyed this. Don't panic. The virus isn't everywhere. And uh, stay socially isolated. Stay happy. Stay safe. And, uh, and may all your Zooms today have uh, space station backgrounds. Thank you all for joining <laughs> us for today's Symbi Beta Live. A lot of fun. Thanks, thank John. You. Thank, thank you, John. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you Bye. soon. Bye. Cheers. Bye-bye now.